Good morning. Good morning. If you have a Bible, you can open to the book of Micah, chapter 2. And you may need to use the table of contents. It's a little smaller book, but there is no shame in that. Micah, chapter 2. Let me uh, pray for us as we get going this morning. Our Father, uh, we are here this morning because we believe in you and because we trust in you. Uh, We believe that you are the ultimate and the only real authority in our lives. And we believe that you are a God who is compassionate and merciful. And so we pray that you would please uh, forgive us for presuming upon your grace We ask that you would forgive us uh, for ever thinking that you would tolerate our sin, our uh, greed, and our iniquity. Uh, We pray that you'd forgive us for our exploitation of the people around us, uh, for our acquisitiveness and our infatuation with violence. And we thank you that you are indeed a God who forgives sin. Jesus, the only reason we're here together this morning is because of you, uh, and, and uh, we believe that you are Lord and that you are King, and we thank you that you have joined us as a human, and that you have walked with us, uh, that you have been exploited with us, that you have died with us, and that you have shared the power of your resurrection with us, and so we, we long for the day that you would come back and that you would uh, restore order to the earth, and that you would subject all your enemies under your feet, and that you would bring peace to your world. Uh, Holy Spirit, uh, we thank you for bringing us together. Uh, We thank you for uh, uniting us to each other, and for joining the bread and the cup uh, so that we would be joined to the Son. Uh, We believe that you have inspired the prophets like the prophet Micah, and so as we're looking at this text this morning, we pray that you will speak to us and that you will have Uh, something to say that will transform our hearts and our minds to look more like Jesus. And it is in uh, the name of the Son and by the power of the Spirit that we pray this. And the church says, So uh, last week we started preaching through uh, the book of Micah. Now, that's seven chapters, and we've got seven weeks that's going to take us right up until Christmas. And Micah is sometimes called the Christmas prophet, Because there's this line in the fifth chapter about how the Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem. But you guys, Micah is anything but holly and jolly. Uh, Especially in the first three chapters, he's getting after it. What Micah is doing in these poems is he has this penetrating insight into human society and economy. And what he's doing is he's, he's doing three things. He's labeling it for what it really is. He's describing his world in a way that uh, the, 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 the powerful people would not want it described. And then he's, second, he's helping us to grieve over that as uh, it's coming to an end. And then third, he's helping us to imagine a new way of being in the world. And that's precisely what he does in chapter 2, which is where we're going to start this morning. Chapter 2, verse 1, I'm going to read the first 11 verses. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Therefore, and anytime you see the word therefore in the prophets, you want to duck. Therefore, says the Lord, behold, against this family I am devising disaster from which you cannot remove your necks, and you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be a time of disaster. In that day they shall take up a taunt song against you and moan bitterly and say, we are utterly ruined. He changes the portion of my people, how he removes it from me. To an apostate he allots our fields. Therefore you will have none to cast the lot, cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. Do not preach, thus they preach, 
One should not preach of such things. Disgrace will not overtake us. Should this be said, O house of Jacob? Has the Lord grown impatient? Are these his deeds? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? But lately, my enemy, or my people, have risen up as an enemy. You strip the rich robe from those who pass by trustingly with no thought of war. The women of my people you drive out from their delightful houses. From their young children you take away my splendor forever. Arise and go, for this is no place to rest, because of uncleanness that destroys with a grievous destruction. If a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people. How do we do? Biblical poetry is dense. Uh, Micah, even though it's only seven chapters, if you just fly through it in 20 or 25 minutes, you're not going to get it all. It, it requires a slow, thoughtful, deliberate, pensive kind of reading. And uh, so just reading through 11 verses in one go, you may not have caught everything, but hopefully you at least caught on to the fact that he's getting after a particular group of people. He's writing in the 8th century, 7th century B.C. Uh, Jerusalem. He's writing to the rich and the powerful people in his city. Specific names, specific faces. Not this anonymous they, but people who know him by name. And to appreciate what he's saying, I think it really helps to know how things work in an ancient economy. What happens is you have the... Uh, the elite live in Jerusalem. That's the royal family and the bankers and the lawyers and the scribes and the academics and the celebrities and the wealthy people, the landlords. They all live in Jerusalem and they're surrounded by peasant farmers. The people who do the grind and sweat daily work of producing food. You have people who produce food, and you have the people in the middle who don't produce any food. And so how are the people who don't produce food supposed to eat? Well, they extract it from the poor person through taxes and mortgages. And Micah is addressing these powerful people who lay awake at night, he says, dreaming up new ways of how can they take more food and more land and more profit from the poor peasant farmer. And surely he has in mind a few things. Surely he's talking about taxes, where the, the powerful people will impose a tax on the vulnerable people so that they have to relinquish some of their crop into the pot, and it's out of the pot that the elite eat. And that that tax takes away from what he, what's left for him and his family to eat. And if the tax becomes too high or if the harvest is not good enough, then he can't afford to pay all of his taxes. And so to do that, he has to take out a second mortgage on his house. And guess who gets to set the rate on the second mortgage? And in the absence of any kind of regulation, it just spirals out of control until eventually the farmer is bankrupt, working as a hired hand on his own land for beans. Can you imagine what this must have been like for the poor working man? And all so that the people in Jerusalem can have their fancy houses and their fancy clothes and their temple and their frivolous stuff, their parties and so on. And what's worse, as Micah says, it's not just that they're exploiting the poor working man, they're also exploiting the travelers. In verses uh, 7 and 8, 8 and 9, verses 8 and 9, see, the thing is, Israel sits on this major thoroughfare between Europe, Africa, and Asia. If you want to process or move goods from Asia into Africa, or from Europe to Africa, or Africa out, you have to go through Israel. And whoever controls this tiny little strip of land controls a big portion of the global economy. And they're setting the tariffs and the tolls as high as they want. And they're effectively ripping the robes, the clothes, right off the backs of the merchants. He says that they steal 
from the, they steal the homes of the widows that their husbands have left for them. They, he accuses them of stealing from the fatherless, who are the most vulnerable of all. And they don't need to do any of this. But they got to do it if they're going to maintain a certain standard of living. And the point of the whole poem is that because you have plotted wickedness, in verse 1, woe to those who devise raw wickedness. Because of that, now in verse 3, God is plotting raw against you. You brought disaster on them, so God's going to bring disaster on you. You ruined their life, so now he's going to ruin your life. And you are going to feel the boot on your neck. And he doesn't clarify exactly how that's going to happen. But Micah has faith that God is going to do justice where they haven't been doing justice. And on that day, the people that you have defrauded, albeit legally, but defrauded, are going to cry out against you, and they are going to say, he stole our land, and he gave it to his friends. And in verse 5, he says, there's not going to be anyone to cast the line for the powerful people on that day. Which, cast the line, what does that mean? That's not something that we talk about. That's not our language, but I like the way that the Good News translation puts it. So then when the time comes for the land to be given back to the Lord's people, there will be no share for any of you. That's the idea. You're not going to get any land. You stole their land, so you're not going to get any land. You're not going to get away with it. This is the whole point of the poem. You're not going to get away with it. You can't treat the poor like that and think you're going to get away unscathed. And then Micah imagines for us, in verses 6 and 7, what he thinks the powerful people will say in response to his message. They're going to say, oh, Micah, don't say that. Don't preach like that. Don't, don't say that, that God is growing impatient. Has the Lord really grown impatient? I mean, does he really get impatient? He's got all the time in the world. He doesn't grow impatient. Even if he doesn't like what we're doing, which may I remind you, we have our rights. Even if he doesn't like it, does, does God really do that kind of thing? Uh, don't say that, Micah. Are these really his deeds? He doesn't do things like that, does he? He doesn't draw the line and say enough is enough. That's not the kind of God that I know. And Micah says in verse 11, oh, I know what kind of preaching you want to hear. I know that you want to hear preachers who will tickle your ears and tell you to pour yourselves another drink and enjoy yourselves. Preachers who will tell you to numb your senses and dull your intellect and assure you that everything is fine. Drunken, dull intellect, that's the kind of preacher for this people. And as much as it might pain us to think about it, I think that we can relate to the targets of Micah's rebuke. I think that we can empathize with them saying, oh, don't say that. Don't, we want people who are going to tell us, don't worry about it. Don't bother with such worldly matters. We're here to talk about spiritual things. Even today, we long for assurances that God will never abandon us. And we will buy the books of anyone who will tell us that God abides indefinitely and unconditionally. We will buy their books, we will listen to their podcasts, we will watch their videos, and we will celebrate them. And Micah, we just don't have much time for. When was the last time you read Micah? Not, you know, barring this week, because you may have been like, oh, we're doing Micah. <laughs> I think we can relate to the powerful here, because we too want to listen to the voices that have no courage and have no integrity, and will tell us everything that we want to hear. When true prophets are called by God, whether we're talking about Moses or Isaiah or Jeremiah, their instinct is to be afraid for their lives because they know they're going to have to say some hard and difficult things. But when false prophets decide to go into business, which is what it is, they do it because they think they can make a prophet telling people that God is for them and, and supports them in whatever it is they want to do. We can relate because we too latch on to messages and Bible studies and home decor that preach God's compassion and his mercy, 
but we just don't know what to do with a God who gets angry. We don't have any room for that. We shy away from a God who draws a line and says enough is enough. But you got to hear me on this. A God who can't get angry is a God who doesn't show compassion. A God who can't get angry is a God who turns away from the world and ignores its pain. But if God is going to listen to the pain of the world and show compassion, he first must get angry. This is what compassion is. As for him to be angry at human sin. See, the truth is God does not abide indefinitely and unconditionally precisely because he's a God of compassion. And so if we choose to ignore God's compassionate anger, and when we believe the lie that God is with us no matter what and I can do anything, and when we turn our ears away from the cries of the helpless, we will, like the land grabbers, find ourselves increasingly far from God's presence. Which is to say, God is present among the helpless. God is present among those who are buried in debt, those who've lost the family farm, those who are behind on their rent, the widows, the immigrant, and the fatherless, those who are far from home or have no home. And if we do not tend to their pain, we will find ourselves further and further from God's presence. So the question is, is Micah chapter 2 good news or is it bad news? Because it's certainly news. Uh, I think it depends on who you are. If you're the poor peasant farmer, bankrupt, working as a hired hand on your own land, this is good news. If you're the mother who's working two jobs because dad is not around anymore, this is good news. If if you are far from home or up to your neck in debt, this is good news. That God will not let it go forever. But if you're the elite, the professional, someone who lives in relative comfort because of the cheap labor of others, this is bad news. If your lifestyle is made possible because of the exploitation of the poor, this is bad news. And perhaps it's fair to say that none of us is really cleanly in one or the other of those categories. We probably have a foot on both sides of that line. But all that means is that for all of us, this is not entirely good news. This is, to some degree, bad news for us. And so maybe you would rather have come in this morning and heard a message about how everything is fine... And don't worry about it. And how the gospel really has nothing to do with the market anyway. And so you're excused from having to think Christianly about your spending or about your participation in the economy. And you can just go ahead and pour yourself another drink. And yet I believe that we are just as much the target of Micah's rebuke as they were. Because we too are the beneficiaries of cheap labor. We are positioned where we are in the global economy because of a history of slave labor and very little attempt at reparations have been made. We are likely each of us wearing clothing that was stitched together by someone who is working for beans in some other part of the world, myself included, the one wearing, not the stitching. (laughs) I think we are broadly aware of people in our own community who grind and sweat all week only to get to the end of the week and barely be able to put food on the table. We are in Micah's crosshairs because of our consumerism. You just watch for it. We've got six or seven weeks left before Christmas. You keep your eye out for consumerism because we love to accumulate our stuff. We are the targets of Micah's invective because just like the powerful people of his day, we trust in the power of violence to keep the whole machine running. He targets people who listen to the cowardly voices that say, well, we've got to keep this whole extraction system running by any means necessary. And when you use those words, you're sanctioning violence. When our way of life comes under some kind of attack, our instinct is to utilize violence. And I'll tell you what, the more that we as Americans 
have created a demand for cheap labor. And the more that we have submerged ourselves in consumerism, and the more that we have trusted in violence to keep it all running, the further we have found ourselves from God's presence. I would submit to you that the reason God seems so absent from the public arena is not that church became less important in people's lives. It's that the church sold out to greed and to consumerism and to militarism. And God punishes his people through the use of of exile, that they'll be uprooted from their land and taken away. But listen to how Micah ends this poem in verse 12. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. He who opens the breach goes up before them, and they break through and pass the gate, going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. Now that is good news. Whoever you are, that's good news. And it's good news in two ways. First of all, it's good news because he says, I'm going to gather you together. You're going to go into exile, but you're going to be gathered together. I'm going to bring you back into the land, and there's going to be plenty to graze on. You'll be like sheep out in in a meadow. There will be plenty for everyone to eat. The point is that exile will not last forever. God will say enough is enough with human sin and he will punish, but he will also say enough is enough with exile and he will restore. The second reason that this little ending is good news is because it says he who opens the breach goes up before them. In the year 586 B.C., Jerusalem was besieged by the Babylonian Empire, and the city wall was breached. And the Babylonians flooded in, slaughtered, plundered, and took people into exile. And what Mike is saying is that breach, that's not the Babylonians breaching the city. That is God himself breaching the city against his own people. But he also says, he who opens the breach goes ahead of them. That is, their king goes with them, the Lord at their head. When Jerusalem is breached, exile begins. And who goes into exile? It's not just the sinners, but it is God himself. God goes into exile with his people. In fact, Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel is written In exile, Jeremiah is written in Jerusalem, and in Jeremiah, which is the longest book of the Old Testament, the Spirit of God is never mentioned once. But in Ezekiel, the Spirit is all over the place, mentioned on every page. Why? Because the Spirit of God is with His people in exile. He's not in Jerusalem. This is good news. Exile will not last forever. And I will be there with you. So, how is Micah 2 God's word for us today? Let me just uh, start to kind of land the plane here by pointing out that Micah gives us a portrait of God who is nothing at all like us. And he gives us a portrait of us who are nothing at all like God. Humans are greedy little creatures. We're acquisitive, and we would never call ourselves that because i got to have all of my stuff. I need all this. But we are acquisitive and covetous and materialistic by nature. And in our greed, we will exploit. We will leverage other humans to do things for us to maintain our own level of comfort. And we are willing to do it by any means necessary. We're anxious and we're cowardly. And we only want to listen to the voices that tell us that everything is fine. And we don't want voices in our lives that will tell us that we're in the wrong. But folks, we're in the wrong. And we presume upon God's presence thinking that it's all going to be fine. And God's really not that interested in the economy anyway. And he's more interested in whether I pray and read my Bible. You know, spiritual stuff. The system of greed and exploitation and violence and cowardice and presumption produces a result in which other humans are left helpless and hungry and cold and poor and bitter. 
And perhaps you can find yourself more or less in one of those two portraits, but the good news for us is that God is none of those things. He is not greedy. He is not exploitative. He is not violent by nature. He is not uh, a coward. He is not hungry or helpless or bitter. He's not like us. Instead, Micah 2 reveals to us a God who is compassionate and present. Angry, yes, but angry only as a result of his compassion and his love and his commitment to his creation. Angry when his children treat one another like this and he has to step in and do for us what we should have been doing ourselves all along. This poem shows us a God who is present with the helpless, who goes into exile with his people. One who is compassionate toward them, who is just toward the powerful and merciful toward the poor. And so here's what I want to tell you this morning. You need to know that if you continue in greedy acquisitiveness and in cowardice and in presumption upon God's presence as though it were indefinite and unconditional, you need to know that God will prove himself to be compassionate. And he will show mercy, but it will be mercy toward those that we have stepped on. And you need to know if you came in helpless and exhausted and bitter, and if you refuse to believe that God is present and merciful, then you are sentencing yourself to despair because there is no other hope. If you don't accept Micah 2 and hold this portrait of God to be true, you are sentencing yourself to wrath and despair. On the other hand, if we would turn from our sin and our covetousness and our self-absolution, you will also find that God is merciful. And if you believe that God is merciful, you will find that he is present. Micah 2 invites us to believe in a God who is just and merciful, who is compassionate and present, who is concerned for his world, and it invites us to be transformed as a result, to change our spending, to change our business, to change our attitudes, to change our pride. So what is it that you need to change? Let me close this with prayer. Holy God, uh, we thank you that you are compassionate and merciful and present. Uh, We thank you that you are a God who doesn't turn away from the pain of the world, but that you hear the cries of the helpless and you enter into it yourself. Father, please forgive us of our covetousness and our presumption. And by your spirit, make us into people who are also concerned for the hurting in our world. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.